Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our website's are Catholicism.org and Reconquest.net. You can email me at bam at Catholicism.org. That's bam at Catholicism.org. Uh, if you have a quick question, suggestion, or um, point to make, uh, and uh, again, keep it short. I get lots of email. Uh, also tonight, we are on episode number 256, and it, we're calling it Roman Empire, Roman Church. And I'm very excited to have as my guest for the second time now, Dr. Alan Fimister. Dr. Fimister is Assistant Professor of Theology and Church History at St. John Vianney Seminary in Denver. And as you will tell, he is a native of England, and but has been educated um, all over, um, Oxford, Austria, and Aberdeen. Um, and he specializes in um, Catholic social teaching and history and church history. Also, uh, he studied patrology in Austria and Britain. So he's uh, quite the, uh, I guess, theological polymath. Is that the right uh, description? But uh, without any further ado, I'll bring Dr. Fimister on, and he's going to discuss with me Roman Empire, Roman Church. Good evening, Dr. Fimister. Good evening, brother. It's great to be on again. Yes, thank you very much. It's it's. I'm so happy that you could take the time to to join us and share your knowledge with us. So I, I have to admit to the audience, uh, uh, full disclosure, that th this subject was something that you yourself had suggested when we were in touch uh, l about the last show. And um, you want to do something on the Roman Empire. And so I asked you what, uh, what you wanted to talk about, you know, what, what was the kind of topics you wanted to cover. And you sent me a nice little outline. So uh, uh, I'm going to um, go by your outline since this is what you want to talk about. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I'll probably just be sort of sitting back uh, listening much of the time. Um, but uh, so why don't we start with the first thing that you, you sent me on your on your five point outline, and that is the role of the Roman Empire in biblical prophecy. Yes. Um, well, um, the uh, obviously one of the key elements of the entire narrative of the Old Testament is uh, the promise to Abraham that one day through him all the nations will be blessed through his descendant. And um, uh, and slowly over the course of the Old Covenant, uh, more clarity as to how that is going to occur begins to appear. And, um, and one of the most important places where things really get very sharp is uh, the book of the prophet Daniel. Um, and one of the most striking... Uh, elements in the book of the prophet Daniel is the uh, the prophecy of the weeks in um, Daniel chapter 9 in which uh, the angel Gabriel uh, gives a, a pretty much a straightforward year prophecy as to when the Messiah is going to appear and uh, there's a, a famous convert to Catholicism from Judaism called Roy Shoman uh, who wrote a book called Salvation is from the Jews, and he 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 goes into the various different prophecies of the Messiah in uh, in the Old Testament, and he, he puts a special emphasis on Daniel. And uh, the reason for this is that uh, um, the angel Gabriel in that chapter um, specifies that 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 from the going forth of the decree for the rebuilding of Jerusalem, which was given out by the Persian great king Artaxerxes. Um, uh, a certain number of sets of seven weeks of years, uh, or sets of seven years, because um, the word week is seven in Hebrew, uh, will elapse uh, before the appearance of Christ the Prince. And when you work out, um, uh, do the sums, uh, what you find is that, um, is that Christ the Prince is prophesied to appear basically halfway through the year 26 B, 26 AD. Um, so that, that's very specific indeed. Um, and um, and I, I often wonder whether or not that's why there was so much messianic fervor in the Holy Land uh, during the time of our Lord's public ministry, because not only was had, had he appeared and started uh, fulfilling prophecy and, and, and performing miracles um, and, uh, and giving this... Uh, 
this teaching with authority, but uh, he, he was doing it at exactly, precisely the right moment. Yeah. And, and also, well, I also wonder whether or not the 60s AD was such a time of ferment as well, because uh, a peer is ambiguous, of course. You could imagine that, that it right. means the Messiah will be born then, or you might think that he's actually going to turn up on the scene then. And if you thought he was going to be born then, the 60s would be more the time you'd think he would uh, turn up as an adult. And that's when, and and there were a lot of false messiahs at that time, because that's around right around the time just before the destruction of the temple, right? And there were lots of false messiahs around then. Exactly. Yeah, you get the the Jewish war, um, in which the Jewish people rise up against the Romans and think that they're going to be temporarily vindicated by uh, a divine intervention, um, and of course it goes catastrophically wrong for them, um, and in. Uh, not only does it go catastrophically wrong for them, but it goes, uh, they're actually um, uh, surrounded by the Roman legions um, at the uh, very, uh, on the 50th anniversary to the day of the crucifixion, because the um, uh, the emperor Vespasian he leaves his son Titus in charge of the war because he becomes emperor halfway through the war. Um, he... Uh, I think it's Titus in command at this point. He, uh, he, he rather sort of cunningly, uh, with horrendous consequences, uh, allows the Jews to go up to the temple for the Passover so that it will be the largest possible population of Jerusalem. And then uh, as, as Passover dawns, he, uh, he encircles and seals off the city of Jerusalem in order to make it as difficult as possible for it to withstand a siege. And the consequence of that is, is, that, it, is that it brings it about that the siege begins 40 years to the day after the uh, crucifixion. And, um, and the, uh, the, the, the siege is terrible, absolutely terrible. I mean, I mean, I think they think that one million people died and a million people were enslaved. And uh, the description that Josephus, who's a contemporary uh, Jewish leader who is captured halfway through the war and changes sides and ends up working for the Flavian dynasty, Vespasian and Titus's dynasty, but he writes uh, histories of the war and, um, and he describes the terrible uh, occurrences in the city and, and how things break down and, and eventually Jerusalem is, is completely destroyed. And uh, I've heard it claimed that that the prophecy that not one stone of the temple would stand upon another was literally fulfilled in the sense that the heat of the fire which finally consumed the temple mount was so great that the gold on, of which the temple was covered was melted mm. and and poured between the stones of the temple. And so when the scavengers descended upon the ruins, every single stone was prized apart ah, in order to, to get the peel gold. off the gold. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, so, okay, so, so, the, so the destruction of Jerusalem, that's, uh, we're talking 70 AD, and what has this to do with the prophecy of Daniel? Well, uh, so, so in chapter 9, uh, Gabe, the Archangel Gabriel ten, tells uh, Daniel that, um, that uh, um, after, he, he says that after th after half a week of years, so that's three and a half years, which is generally held to be the length of our Lord's public ministry, after the appearance of Christ the Prince, all sacrifice and offering will cease. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's very interesting because, of course, our Lord dies on the cross three and a half years after the beginning of his public ministry, um, uh, bringing to an end the uh, efficacy uh, of the ex opere operantis efficacy of the of the old covenant, and um, and uh, he also says that Christ the Prince will be cut off, and um, and he says that um, in fact um, uh, the the Talmud itself records that there was a tradition of of tying a uh, a red cord across the entrance to the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the High Priest would enter the Holy of Holies and pronounce the Divine Name in order to offer the sacrifice to take away the sins of the people for that year. And um, the uh, the red cord would miraculously turn white. And um, and the Talmud records that um, 
for uh, that, that on certain years when something was wrong and the sacrifice for some reason was not acceptable to God, uh, it wouldn't turn white and then terrible things would happen to the people. And uh, the Talmud recalls that for 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, it didn't turn white. The miracle stopped. And that's exactly, that would mean that in the year of the crucifixion itself, um, the, this, oh. this sign of the, of the transformation of the cord ended. Um, and then, then uh, uh, the Archangel Gabriel goes on to say that um, after another half a year of weeks, so that's uh, half a week of years, so that's another three and a half years, the covenant with the many will be confirmed. Um, the covenant with the many, presumably referring to the universalization of the of, of the covenant promised to Abraham, and um, and and therefore presumably to uh, the the baptism of Cornelius and the conversion of Saint Paul which probably occurred at that time and um, when the gentiles the first, start when the gentiles start coming in on mass right when, when cornelius um and then uh, and then he says and then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the temple and the city and that's the the very striking line um uh, that um because the peop the, pr the the prince who is to come in this passage up to this point has been the Christ, and and I, I wonder. And in fact, uh, Josephus, the historian I mentioned, who lived at the time, he he even tried to claim that Vespasian, the emperor Vespasian, was the Messiah. Um, and the, the Roman historians, um, uh, Suetonius and Tacitus, they tell us about uh, the fact that the Jews rebelled because it was believed that at this time a universal monarch would arise from Judea. Um, uh, and, 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 but in fact, and Josephus says this as well, Josephus says that they misinterpreted it, that the universal monarch was in fact Vespasian, in fact, so does uh, Tastus and, and Suetonius, um, that the universal monarch was in fact Vespasian. But in, in fact, um, of course, uh, uh, a universal monarchy did emerge. Uh, spiritual monarchy, universal monarchy occurred at that time. St. Peter was martyred and succeeded uh, by Linus, St. Linus, as the, uh, the his first successor, the second pope. And, um, uh, and, the, um, and, and, and Daniel actually calls the, the people of the Messiah those who destroy the temple and the city. Um, so he appears to be, uh, well, Gabriel appears to be saying that the Romans are the, uh, are the huh. people of the Messiah, which is, uh, which is very interesting and, and, and connects to other things that uh, uh, are said in the book of, uh, of Daniel. Earlier on, uh, there's, there's two uh, different symbolic prophecies of a series of four empires that will succeed each other leading up to the time of the Messiah. One of them is, is uh, a prophecy about a, a statue that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who destroyed Jerusalem the first time round, um, uh, has of he has this this vision of a of a of a of a statue that's gold at the top, and then has silver shoulders, and then a bronze torso, and iron legs that eventually mingle with clay, and finally our only clay has feet purely of clay. Um, and then the, 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 the idol is destroyed by a stone cut from a mountain, not by human hand. And then the stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. And, and this seems to be a prophecy of, uh, of a succession of five um, different monarchies, um, uh, which, are, which almost every one of the fathers, I believe Ephraim the Syrian gives it a different interpretation, but but uh, but but every other father who comments on it interprets to mean uh, the Babylonian Empire, the uh, Persian Empire, the Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great and his successors, and then finally the Roman Empire is the Iron Monarchy, um, and Saint Jerome says that uh, um, well. Um, even earlier writers say that, that the Roman Empire will be divided in two, which of course it was. And uh, St. Jerome says that it will then become mingled with barbarian nations, which he says he can see happening in his own time. Uh -huh. um, because the Roman Empire is becoming uh, overwhelmed. Uh, milit well, it's a strange business whereby they, they sort of franchised out their military capacity until it was completely run by barbarians. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then uh, and Saint Hippolytus um, 
he actually says that the ten toes of the idols will be ten democracies who will event, in, into which the two halves of the Roman Empire will eventually be divided. Um, and uh, so they're all very mysterious. But anyway, um, uh, and then the kingdom of the Messiah is the uh, is 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 the kingdom uh, which destroys the the ark. Idol, the, the the stone cut off not by hand that then becomes a mountain, filling the entire earth, and there's a different um a, a different representation of the same events later on in the book, um where the the four empires are shown as four different beasts, um and the first one is is a lion with wings, and uh, then a, a then a, a a bear, and then a a, a a leopard with four heads. And uh, and then uh, finally a nameless beast with iron claws that crushes all the others beneath it and is is completely terrifying, and um, uh, which has uh, seven heads and ten horns. And um, uh, and then uh, it's interesting. The first of the four empires, the lion has its uh, its wings plucked off, uh, and it stands on its hind legs and is given the heart of a man, and this appears to uh, symbolize the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar to monotheism. So, so he removes his pretensions to divinity. That's the removal of, of the, the wings. wings yeah. And then he stands up in his hind legs and given the heart of a man. So the state itself remains pagan, but the ruler um, uh, is, is, is humanized by his, uh, his acceptance of, of the one true God. Um, and then, um, and then the uh, the nameless beast is finally destroyed by one like a son of man. Um, so the uh, so so people often think, well, what, what's what, what's this meaning of this title that our Lord used? And it seems to have been very cryptic uh, when he used it himself, um, and people wanted to know what it meant. Um, and uh, and of course, son of man uh, is used, for example, in the prophet, prophet Ezekiel just to mean a human being, but but specifically this fifth empire in in daniel is called one like a son of man because it, meaning that this is a, a an authentically human kingdom an authentically human polity because it, it's it, it it worships the one true god but it's also an individual as well as a um as well as a as well as a as a, as a kingdom and uh, and the thrones are set up famously thrones plural are set up which is also was a cause of great uh, interest uh, i believe also in the talmud there's a rabbi whose name i forget um who uh, who suggested that the reason why the plural is used is because one of the thrones was for david and one was for god the ancient of days as he's described in that passage and uh, this got him the other rabbis got very annoyed and this suggests how so dangerously Christian. Um, yeah, that's so, right. That's right. Yeah. Son, son of God and son of David, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so, um, so the in a way that the son of the term son of man already contains uh, the the doctrine of the mystical body, because it, it's it's a it's a reference to this kingdom of the Messiah as well as to the Messiah himself as being as being the same personhood. Um, and of course, our Lord makes it finally uh, explicit and clear that that's what He's referring to uh, at, the, at, the, at the at the climactic moment of His trial um, before Caiaphas, when He He adjures him, "I adjure you by the living God, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One?" And He says, uh, "I am," and you will see the Son of Man coming at the right hand of the power in the clouds of heaven, and. Uh, Caiaphas tears his garments. Um, so, so you have our Lord both confessing his divinity and that he is the Messiah, the, pro pro the promised Messiah, and the doctrine of the mystical body all in the same sentence um, at, at this key moment in his trial. Um, but uh, there's this key line when, when it says in Daniel that the Messiah will take over the kingdom of the uh, you take over well this is the key question it says and the saints of the most high who are in, uh, embodied in the son of man the saints of the most high will inherit the kingdom and um so uh that's been interpreted it's usually interpreted interestingly by western commentators uh it's interpreted much more boringly as it were as just meaning they it will then be the saints of the most high who are in charge of things 
Um, but uh, Eastern commentators uh, um, have interpreted it more narrowly as meaning that the fourth monarchy, the kingdom to refer to the fourth monarchy, uh, that is the Roman Empire, will be inherited by the saints of the Most High. Um, Saint Jerome is not really enthusiastic about that interpretation in his in his commentary, but uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, who albeit is not a not a, a unproblematic figure, um, but he's a very important writer, um, he, uh, he in his uh, oration in praise of Constantine uh, he he interprets that as meaning the taking over of the Roman Empire by the saints of by by, by the Christians by the saints of the Most High, and um, and then that that was the general interpretation in the East. Uh, the um, uh, Saint Cyril, the Apostle of the Slavs, we have a we have an eyewitness life of Saint Cyril called the Slavic Life of Constantine the Philosopher. Because his baptismal name was Constantine, he only took Cyril was his uh, his name uh, in religion, which he took just when he became a monk, only a few months before he died in Rome. Um, but he was a Byzantine; uh, he he belonged to the Eastern Roman Empire, um, and he uh, he was sent on a number of missions by the Eastern emperors in the ninth century, and uh, one of these was to the Khazars uh, in the Crimea who were an Asiatic tribe who were thinking of converting to Judaism. Uh, oddly, that was, but that's something that happened in those days, apparently. Um, mm. And uh, he was sent out there to try and convince them to convert to Christianity instead, and he ended up having a disputation with some rabbis. And uh, the dis- part of the disputation revolved around the meaning of these prophecies in Daniel. And the rabbis said... Um, that uh, it couldn't be that uh, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah because um, it, it's clear in Daniel's prophecies that the Roman Empire will be destroyed by the kingdom of the Messiah, which will succeed to it. But uh, Cyril himself, or Constantine as he was then, Constantine the philosopher, was a, uh, was a citizen of the Roman Empire. Um, the Byzantine Empire, as historians call it, but it, it, it was known at, at the time by its own people as the Roman Empire, um, and uh, and and so it's still there. So how can um, how can Jesus be the Messiah? And um, uh, Saint Cyril says, no, no, you misunderstand. Uh, although it is still called by the Roman name, uh, the Roman Empire is the fifth monarchy. It is the kingdom of the Messiah. The, the Christians. Uh, from all lands have succeeded to the dominion of the Romans. So, so he has a, he has the same interpretation as as, as Eusebius of Caesarea that that, that when um, Daniel says the saints of the Most High will inherit the kingdom, that this means specifically the um, the taking over of the uh, Roman dominion by the uh, by the Church by the Christians. And uh, and again, we see signs of that in the New Testament, where um, uh, where um, our Lord, uh, when he's uh, telling the parable of the uh, of the vineyard, um, he uh, he asks, he gets the end. Uh, the, the the evil tenants who killed the son of the owner of the vineyard are put to death by the owner of the vineyard, and uh, he says um, he says to the to the high priests. Um, uh, what do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? And, and he says he will they, he'll take the vineyard from them and he will punish them very severely. And uh, our Lord says, Amen, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation that will bear the fruit thereof. And uh, again, that's that's in the singular. And and in uh, in Luke's gospel, I think it is, um, he immediately follows it with the parable of the wedding feast. And it, it's a, a, a version of the parable that people are often less familiar with in which the the king who organized the wedding feast actually goes and sacks the city. Yeah, the, the, yeah, this is the this is the mean one. <laughs> this is, he will destroy those people. He says it right in there. He will destroy those people. Yes, and he will send his armies to destroy those people. Um, so, uh, so, so there's, there's there's all these hints about about the Romanness of the church. Um, uh, throughout all of these passages that, that and, and it isn't just because I mean sometimes uh, you get this idea arises with people that um, that St. Peter just liked you know 
central Italian cuisine or something. And that's why <laughs> we decided to situate the Supreme Pontificate in the city of Rome. Or the idea that, oh, well, it's politically important, it has really good transport links, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put it there. Uh, that's the sort of logic that leads to, you know, Moscow being supposedly the third Rome or, or Washington, D.C. or whatever. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, so, so in other words, what you're saying is that from, from, from all eternity, there was this providential role uh, that, that God had in view uh, of the Roman Empire that it's not just an accident of history that that happened to be, you know, the, the, the hub of activity in the world. So St. Peter said, well, let's just go there. Yes, absolutely. There's there's a reason for it, and it's there was there was a sort of uh, debate about this uh, in the um, uh, during the uh, first Vatican Council uh, on for the the constitu- first dogmatic constitution on the Church of Christ, Pastor Eternus, which defined the uh, universal ordinary jurisdiction of the Pope and his infallibility. Um, uh, they they discussed um, exactly what the status. Of the Romanness of the Church is, you know, whether the whether the Supreme Pontificate could be moved from Rome to somewhere else, um, and the, the 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 discussion became rather subtle. Uh, it was a question as to whether it could whether it was de jure divino, meaning whether or not Christ had specifically said, you know, got out a map and pointed at Rome and said to Saint Peter, right, that's where we're going, um, <laughs> or whether or not St. Peter had decided to put it there. Um, and they, they, the council decided not to uh, decide between those two questions. Um, but then there was a subsidiary question as to whether or not it was changeable. And in that respect, the council did decide um, that, the, that the successor of St. Peter is the Pope and the successor of St. Peter is only the successor of St. Peter because he's the Bishop of Rome, because yes. he succeeds St. Peter as the Bishop of Rome, uh, because it, in the end, it solemnly defines that, that, that you know, it anathematizes anyone who denies that the Roman, the Roman pontiff is the, uh, is the successor of St. Peter and the Supreme Pastor of the Universal Church. Um, and, and this, this, uh, confirmed something in the oath, uh, sorry, the, um, syllabus of modern errors, which had come out, uh, a few years earlier, um, uh, which which condemned anyone who says that by the decree of an ecumenical council or the consensus of all peoples, the supreme pontificate be, could be removed from the city of Rome to another city and another bishop, mm. uh, and it condemns that as an error. So, um, so it's it, it's it's not changeable, um, and uh, and and it seems uh, seems to be uh, of great significance. Um, and and it was generally generally believed to be of great significance. And but you do often hear now people talk as if as if it was a purely administrative question that could be changed, and the Bishop of Pueblo or Birmingham, Alabama, or or Octomukti or uh, what could become the uh, uh, could become the Supreme Pontiff. The Dom Dom Guerinjay in his uh, liturgical year, I think it's the reading for Good Friday. He. He speaks of a tradition that has our Lord um, being crucified with with his back towards Jerusalem and simultaneously facing Rome. And Ooh. and while while he's being crucified, he's he because of the Eli Eli Lama Sabakani, he's quoting um Psalm twenty one and uh, which which begins, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But by the end, it has this sort of happy ending, talking about the people which will be born, which the Lord hath made. And he's saying that, according to Dom Guernsey, facing Rome with his back towards Jerusalem, as if now there's going to be this sort of translation of the kingdom of God on earth from Jerusalem to Rome. Yes. No, I mean, there are many, many striking suggestions of this. And... um uh, and and it, it it's um well as I say there's a slight difference of nuance between the Eastern and Western Fathers on this point and um, and you see uh, so so for example Saint Augustine he has some very interesting things to say in the City of God about the parallelism between the two cities um, the City of God and the City of the World and uh, Cain and Abel on the one hand and Romulus and Remus on the other. He says that um, he says that uh, the, the two cities uh, were founded in in the human race 
by the murder of Abel by Cain, because Cain, uh, so, so I suppose Adam and Eve had been part of the city of God, they fell and, and became part of the city of the world, which the two cities already having been established by the rebellion of the fallen angels. Um, and then they were restored to the city of God by the penances that, uh, that God gave them at the end of Genesis chapter 3. And um, but, so then the human race were penitent members of the city of God. Uh, but then Cain slays Abel out of jealousy at the acceptability of Abel's sacrifice in, his, in, in God's sight. And, uh, and from that point, there are two permanently two cities going on in the world. And, um, but he contrasts that with um, uh, Romulus and Remus, who are the founders of the city of Rome. And according to the Roman legend about the foundation of the city of Rome, um, the two of them are both trying to kill each other because they both want the city to be named after uh, themselves. Mm. Oh, um, and, uh, and and eventually Romulus kills Remus, and so it becomes Rome and not Reims. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, so he says that he says that shows how fratricidal uh, fratricidal hatred is lies at the heart of fallen, unredeemed human society, and and fratricidal hatred divides redeemed human society from unredeemed human society from. That, that human society whose sacrifice is acceptable to God, and that's human society whose sacrifices are not acceptable to God. Um, and but, but Saint Augustine has a sort of um, uh, an ambiguous uh, attitude towards Rome. He sees this sort of he says he says um, he points out that, that Romulus, when he wanted to try and um, uh, get citizens for his new city, um, uh, he decided to sort of put. Uh, personal ads throughout Italy <laughs> saying that uh, that anyone who's an escaped convict could come and settle in his new city. So, uh, and he and he suggests that this is uh, this is an image of the church um, because uh, the church is made up of forgiven sinners. Um, so the so the the shadowy pagan image of the church mirror of the church is made up of escaped convicts. Um, but I don't know whether it's because he's an African. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but he has, he, he has, he's a definite sort of, he's, 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 he's plays with these ideas and he's willing to admit Rome, uh, as, as a, as a, a sort of parody or shadow of, 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 of the city of God. But he, he, he's less, euphoric about about Rome simply being the earthly expression of the city of God than some of his contemporaries were like like the great liturgical poet Prudentius um, he has a, a very euphoric passage in which he, he describes the function of the Roman Empire in, 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 in carrying forth the gospel and um, a, a Constantine the Great himself the first Christian Roman Emperor he he reads out, um, I think, if I remember rightly, he reads out at the Council of Nicaea uh, the fourth eclogue of Virgil, which is a, a very mysterious poem, which, which seems to echo the language of the prophet Isaiah about the lion lying down with the lamb and, and talks about a child who is about to be born who will be the bearer of universal monarchy and peace throughout the world. And, and Constantine and many others thought that this was a Virgil himself predicting uh, the um, the coming of the Messiah because he was a contemporary of the incarnation, which is of course um, why why Dante picks him to be the the escort, his own escort through uh, the Inferno and the Purgatorio, right? Yes, absolutely. You're listening Sorry. to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie. I'm interviewing Dr. Alan Fimister, and we're talking about Roman Empire, Roman Church. Uh, so the so um, there are different. I, I, by the way, I've heard that Saint Augustine. Uh, some writers th accuse him of a bit of Punic pride, uh, <laughs> because you know that uh, he wasn't enthusiastic about all those wars in North in, in Northern Africa, which is where his people were from. Yeah. And, but, and he, he's quite down on imperialism. Uh, in in the City of God, he has a very interesting passage in which he says that a desire to to obtain bloated dominions um, is 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 just as irrational uh, just as irrational as 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 someone you know eating to excess and rendering himself obese. It's 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 uh, it's a very interesting passage, and he says, whereas someone who lives in a little 
you know, lives on their own homestead, you know, and works hard and looks after their own family and minds their own business and concentrates on being virtuous, uh, it le- leads, in fact, a much happier life than someone who, who burdens themselves with vast unnecessary riches. And he, he contrasts this with, with, a, with, a, with a nation uh, uh, being at peace with its own little territory and its own people as opposed to the bloated imperialism of, of, of the Roman Empire and other empires. And, and that's a very important uh, a very important element in, in understanding properly the the role of, of, of Roman of Rome and, and the Roman Empire in, in salvation history and in prophecy because uh, Rome certainly isn't uh, Rome has a very sinister role as well as a positive one um, in scripture. Um, uh, Saint Leo the Great tries to sort of synthesize what Saint Augustine says with the more positive understanding of Rome. Uh, in his sermon for the Feast of the Apostles, Peter and Paul, he contrasts Peter and Paul. He takes up St. Augustine's contrast of Cain and Abel with with uh, Romulus and Remus, and he contrasts Romulus and Remus with Peter and Paul. And he says that just as those who were by nature brothers uh, founded the pagan city of Rome and its pretended universal empire in, in the fratricidal bloodletting between them, uh, so uh, uh, Peter and Paul refounded Rome um, uh, in and were made brothers in the blood of their martyrdom, um, uh, being martyred on the same day uh, for the for the one Christ, and and they thereby refounded Rome and bestowed upon her the true universal dominion of the Holy See. So so he sort of brings to a satisfyingly pro-Roman conclusion. The logic of Saint Augustine's original uh, contrast of, of Cain and Abel with Romulus and Remus, uh, and, and that becomes a, a big part of the uh, of, of the underlying differences between the East and the West in the first millennium before the Great Schism at the beginning of the second millennium. That um, they both see the Church and the fifth monarchy of the Messiah as fundamentally Roman. But the, the Westerners, the Latins, see it as Roman in the final analysis because of the papacy, which was uh, which was which succeeded to the dominion of the Caesars, um, whereas uh, whereas the Byzantines in the East, in in New Rome, Constantinople, they see it as as the kingdom of the Messiah as, as being the uh, being the still existing Roman Empire that hasn't fallen and is still functioning in the East. And, and although the Westerners see a role for the Roman emperor, um, their, their role, the, the, the roles of the two, the, the perception of the roles of emperor and pope are sort of reversed on e- either side of the Adriatic. So the, so the, the, the Byzantines think of the, the real principle of unity in the Christian world as the one emperor who everybody ultimately accepts as the supreme uh, ruler of the Christians and that, that, that he tolerates these sort of franchisee kingdoms in the West who, uh, who, have, um, who, who have a certain degree of autonomy but uh, shouldn't get above themselves. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, they, uh, and they think that some um, uh, – and they think of the, of the church in contrast as much more federal with the, the pope having a, a higher honor than the other – patriarchs but the, but those patriarchs pretty much getting on with their own business whereas the latins see it completely the other way around they think okay well we acknowledge a kind of primacy of honor for the emperor in constantinople um but we are you know we're free to do what we want in our own dominions the kings the, the barbarian kings in the west but the real principle of unity for christendom is, is the universal monarchy in the spiritual order of the pope in rome and and then that, that those those so long as everybody agrees on who the emperor is and on the primacy of the pope the fact that the nuances of the theory are not quite exactly the same um the, the, doesn't explode the, this is actually a very interesting a, a point um the which of course means that in 1453 when the eastern empire falls and by the way the the the, the constantine the 11th was in union with rome when he died yeah. um but when when the fall of the empire in the east happens this of course should lead to a sort sort of a crisis of faith 
uh, among the, uh, the the Byzantine Christians if that's their worldview. Mm. But I suppose that that gets made up for when Moscow gets proclaimed shortly after that, I believe, the Third Rome. And then you have the reign of the czars, which, of course, should lead to another crisis of faith in, <laughs> in, uh, in 1917, shouldn't it? Yes. Well, I mean, um, before uh, the fall of Constantinople, um, a few decades earlier, if I remember rightly, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, pa- the, the bishops in Moscow had stopped praying in the liturgy for the emperor. They decided, you know, well, he's not that powerful anymore. He only rules sort of Constantinople and a few suburbs. Um, but, you know, it seems a bit silly to be praying for him, you know, all the way out here in the east. And uh, the patriarch Constantinople is furious and, and tells them off and says that, that it's not an optional part of the Christian world that there be an emperor or not be an emperor, and they absolutely must in all liturgies pray for the emperor. And um, uh, and the um, uh, but then uh, it goes it, it goes round the other way when the, when Constantinople finally does fall, they they start to um, try and claim that the rulers of Muscovy are in fact the successors of the emperors in Constantinople, helped by the fact that Zoe Paleologa. Um, uh, one of the uh, relatives of um, the last uh, Byzantine emperor uh, marries into the Russian, uh, the Russian fam- princely family. I think she marries Ivan the Terrible, actually, old lady. Um, and uh, <laughs> the um, and uh, eventually they sort of bribe a patriarch of Constantinople in the 16th century, formally to recognise the um, uh, the the ruler of Muscovy as as Tsar as an emperor. Um, and there's a little bit of a row about that, but he kind of pulls it off in the end. And yes, so from he, that, from that, from, from around this period, you, as you say, we have this idea of Muscovy or, or Russia as the uh, as the third Rome. In case the listeners aren't aware of it, the the um, the uh, Tsar uh, is it comes from Caesar, just like Kaiser in German uh, comes from Caesar. Just so, so that's the point of reference for all all of those titles. And to this day, the Russian Federation has the double-headed eagle of the uh, of the Roman Empire as its coat of arms. That's right, that's right. So adopted again after the fall of communism. Um, yeah. So, so the um, uh, but the the real crisis, in some ways, the real root of the Great Schism between uh, um, Rome and Constantinople, comes in 800 AD because um, uh, the the all of the the West that which had been taken over by barbarians. Uh, and these rulers understood that they ruled almost all of them uh, understood that they ruled the West their little bit of the West on this kind of franchise from the emperor in Constantinople uh, the famous letter of um, of Theodoric the Ostrogothic king of Italy uh, writing to the emperor Anastasius in Constantinople and he says our monarchy is an imitation of yours a copy of the only empire on earth Huh. Um, so, so this this is their, their their understanding is that the only legitimate um, the only legitimate Commonwealth is the Roman Empire. And and, um, and, and doesn't the, and and this goes all the way back to that date which we assign uh, to be the fall of the Empire in the West, which you know, historians are, uh, I think rightfully argue the 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 uh, the truth of that claim. I mean, it had kind of already fallen, but when Romulus Augustulus gets toppled by, what's his name, Oatiker, um, yes. who uh, Oatiker actually sent the crown of the Roman Western Emperor to Byzantium, right? So yes. he, he, he actually acknowledged right from the get-go, he, I'm, not, I'm not the uh, Roman emperor, I, I'm just the king, he, I'm just a, a you know, Germanic, whatever, Frankish king, and, um, but, but these guys are the actual emperors, we're just sort of in their satellite, sort of orbiting around their satellite. Yes, so so um, Daniel's prophecy is apparently fulfilled in, in the separation of the Roman Empire out into an eastern and western sections, mm-hmm. which first occurs under Diocletian at the end of the 3rd century, but then it, it kind of gets united and separated again several times. But finally, at the end of the 4th century, the two sons of uh, Theodosius the Great, who is the the first emperor to make Catholicism, specifically the, the religion of the Roman Empire, the first one to refer to the Pope as the Pontifex Maximus instead of the uh, emperor. And um, he, he leaves the empire, the east and west, to his two sons, uh, Honorius and Arcadius, and it is never 
reunited after that point, but it, it falls apart uh, in the West, and it's all basically entirely being ruled by these barbarians. And as you say, the barbarian who was ruling Italy at the time says, well, we don't really need uh, a, a sort of a pretend emperor here in the West. We might, if we're going to have nominal sovereignty, it might as well be of, of the nominal sovereignty of a real sovereign in Constantinople instead of the nominal sovereignty of a purely nominal sovereign um, in the West. So yes, as you say, he retires Romulus Augustus to a villa and sends his regalia back to Constantinople. And Constantinople doesn't accept this because they in fact didn't recognize Romulus Augustus. They, Augustus, they, they thought this other chap called Julius Nepos was the rightful emperor who was living in exile at the time, but they but he dies a few, uh, four years later anyway, so, the, so that's the end of it. So from, from 480 onwards, the emperors in Constantinople see themselves as the sole emperors of the Roman world. Now, it seems uh, to me that if Theodosius had, had said that the pope is the um, Pontifex Maximus, which prior to that was the title that the emperors had had, then that's a, that, that's a de facto recognition that the, that, of that Western idea of the universality of the, of the pope and the emperor being um, something that, you know, was, was the imperial part of it was something that could be a sort of a shared authority and not, um, the, and, and the principle of unity is in the prince of bishops, not in the prince of princes. Well, it's interesting because the, uh, the original ideology of the Roman Empire called the Principate, uh, from 27 8 BC, when um, uh, Octavian, the, uh, the the adopted son of, of Julius Caesar, is given the title Augustus, um, he claims to be restoring the proper normal functioning of the of the institutions of the Roman Republic, and to just have a sort of honorary position. Uh, of, of everyone defers to him, but he's just a humble magistrate who happens to hold many magistracies simultaneously. Um, and uh, and in fact, he is, although he also holds the title of Pontifex Maximus, uh, were the Pontifex Maximus to be a different person to him, which of course he never was, because he, he handed on that title along with the the title Augustus to his successors. But from the time of Theodosius, they're separated out again between the Pope and the Emperor. Um, the Pontifex Maximus would be a higher ranking magistrate of the Roman Republic huh. than what's called the Princeps, uh, which is the, 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 the humbler legal title of the emperors. Um, yes, so, so as, as you say, already in a way, the, the, the very decree which establishes Catholicism as the religion of the Roman Empire and calls uh, Pope Damasus the Pontifex um, uh, is... Um, is implicitly conceding a higher ranking position to the Bishop of Rome, to the Emperor of the Romans. Now, now I, when, I don't, there's no way that we could get through your entire uh, outline that you sent, so I'm hoping that you'd be willing to come back for a part two. Um, oh, possibly. Sure. But what I'd like to, what I'd like to, we have about seven minutes to go, and what I'd like, what I'd like to do during that time, could you tell us what ha so what happens on Christmas Day of the year 800? And what's the significance uh, of that vis-a-vis -vis the relation to the uh, the church to the Eastern Empire, uh, or should, should, I should say to the papacy to the Eastern Empire, and what that implies for subsequent history of the eventual Rome, Holy Roman Empire? So um, uh, the uh, the Franks, uh, who one of these barbarian kingdoms in in the uh, in the West, which had been given a kind of recognition by the emperor in Constantinople, the uh, um, the first Frankish king, the first Christian one, Clovis, is made uh, an honorary consul by the emperor Anastasius, um, and uh, so they're, they're recognised as sort of legitimate uh, placeholders for the emperor in the West. Over the intervening centuries, between 500 or so, when this recognition occurred, and 800, um, uh, the Franks had taken over all the other kingdoms in the West. They, 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 they got rid of them. All. So, so the Muslims, Islam has emerged in the meantime and spread over much of the former Roman Empire and taken over the whole of Spain. But everything that the Muslims haven't taken over in the West um, uh, is now ruled by the Franks, at least in mainland Western Europe. 
and um and so the Franks are a bit twitchy about accepting that the emperor in Constantinople is their superior um, because they rule as much, if not more, territory than him. <laughs> and uh, there's this tension building up. And, and they often seem to be interested in picking theological fights uh, with, the, with, the em- with the Romans in Constantinople, uh, which might justify a separation and a, a repudiation of the recognition of the superiority of the emperor. Um, but then their work is sort of done for them because um, there had been a a big theological problem because the Eastern Empire had embraced iconoclasm, a heresy denying the legitimate use of sacred images in in Catholic worship. And uh, and, and that had been raging in the East for a long time. And finally that came to an end when uh, the emperor died and his widow, a woman called Irene of Athens, um, uh, takes over running the state for her uh, her son, who's a minor, the Emperor Constantine the Sixth, and she ends the iconoclastic controversy. She summons the uh, Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Second Council of Nicaea, and that uh, they they condemn iconoclasm as a heresy, and everything looks fine. And then her son comes of age, and he's sort of irritated at her role and puts her away in a convent, and she gets irritated at that, and she overthrows him in a coup in 797 and gouges his eyes out and accidentally kills him. It's rather unpleasant. In the um, same room where she had given birth to him, I think. It's, quite, it's terrifying. <laughs> uh, I, I'm told she's venerated as a saint in the Orthodox Church, but I, I'm not sure if this is, <laughs> this is true. Um, but, uh, they have um, different standards. She, <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but she... Um, uh, it, it's illegal in Roman law for a woman to hold office. So the Franks say, well, well, she starts calling herself the emperor. Um, uh, she actually uses the male title as if that would get around the problem. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, the Franks are like, well, that's no good. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, a row starts in the West because um, uh, Leo III is, is uh, not from the same family as the previous pope, uh, Pope Adrian in the first and um and he's also not from a big roman aristocratic family at all so he doesn't have much of a local power base and there's an attempt to depose him and they try and gouge his eyes out as well in 799 and his eyes are miraculously restored and he escapes from his captors and flees across the alps to the king of the franks charles in order to seek his assistance and uh, this causes a generalized panic because of um because of a prophecy that that when the, when the restraining power, which the fathers had interpreted as, as the power of Rome, was taken away, the Antichrist would come. And there were varying interpretations of what that power was. Some people thought it was the emperor, some people thought it was the pope. But in fact, both the emperor and the pope had been deposed. Uh, so, and, and according to uh, the Septuagint calculations, the year 800 was going to be the 6,000th year after the creation of the world, which many of the early fathers had suggested would be when the Antichrist would appear. So there was terror that the Antichrist was going to appear because there was no emperor and no pope. So um, so Charles, the king of the Franks, took Leo III back to Rome, ejected the people who had attempted to depose him, and, um, and then Leo III um, uh, and, and a, a council of, of local Roman clerical and lay notables suggested to him that he might take the apparent, the legally vacant Roman title which had been stolen by Irene from her son. And, uh, and he agreed, and on Christmas morning, uh, 800 AD, uh, he came to uh, St. Peter's Basilica and uh, while he was kneeling after the singing of the gospel, um, the uh, Pope Leo III took a crown and proclaimed him Roman Emperor um, to Charles the Augustus, crowned by God, great and pacific Emperor of the Romans, be life and victory. And he placed the crown on his head. And then the, the, the Franks and the Romans repeated that acclamation. And, uh, and there was a formal ceremony of elevating a Roman Emperor. And uh, it's a very interesting moment uh, and, and deeply offensive to the, uh, the Romans in Constantinople, but seen as, 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 the, as the proper proper return of the Roman imperial title to the West and to the city of Rome by the Latins in the West and, and becomes the great, great source of tension, uh, which is not really resolved until just before the, great, the, the end of the empire in Constantinople between the Latins and the Greeks. Now, how was it? Okay, so how was it resolved? 
Well, um, uh, at the Council of Florence, um, uh, the the when the uh, the Emperor John the Eighth. Uh, Paleologos came back into union with the Holy See after the Great Schism, which really, really the Great Schism's deep cause is this coronation in 800. Um, uh, both he is referred to in the document of Florence, um, Letento Celi, as, as John, Emperor of the Romans. And, uh, and, and two thrones were set up in the Basilica in Florence, uh, one for the Western Emperor, who wasn't there, but symbolically there was one for the Western Emperor and one for John VIII, um, as, as, as implying that the Holy See was recognizing an Eastern oh. and a Western Emperor okay. once more, rather than that the Western line was the only legitimate one. Okay. For the last, he was the last but one Emperor in Constantinople. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I really hope you can come back and do a part two because there's so much more that, that, of, of this uh, subject that we can keep going on. Thank you very much, Dr. Femister. And you've been listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Premium Channel. God bless and many people.